I'm Troy Van Voris. I'm a professor of chemistry at MIT, and our work focuses on how chemistry can be used to store energy and how to change energy from one form into another, a lot of which has to do with new technologies for storing renewable energy, so electricity from the sun or ways of using chemical energy uh, that would not consume as many fossil fuels as we currently do. The tools that we use for this are those of theoretical chemistry, which is maybe not familiar to everyone. You know, we're not chemists who are in the lab pipetting things or using test tubes. Uh, we spend a lot of our time with pencil and paper and using computers in order to try to use mathematics uh, and the laws of physics to understand how molecules are going to behave. Uh, so we have questions of the why and the how that go into storing energy in molecular forms. I often like to say that, that chemistry bears a large portion of the blame for some of the situations that we have here. Uh, we, chemistry is the science that lets us utilize fossil fuels in the first place. Chemistry is probably the primary science that has led to the explosion of the human population over time through fertilizers and antibiotics and, and all kinds of chemical advances that have allowed, allowed human flourishing. But then that human flourishing has led to a whole host of other problems. And I think chemistry is part of the solution to those problems as well. And it's incumbent on us, upon us to think about that kind of thing. I, I got involved in this because of uh, really sort of fundamental curiosity questions. And I'd be in science classes and, and the teachers would teach me about things like particles that could move from one place to another without appearing to go through the space in between. Uh, or all kinds of paradoxes that happen with something being in two places at once or having a, being in a superposition of two states at the same time. And I was just fascinated by the fact that there was this microscopic world that, that behaved in this way that was so different from the world around us. And then I followed that down the rabbit hole and I discovered that those ideas had applications in all kinds of interesting areas, uh, which has led me to where I am today. Um, but ultimately, the, the kernel of all, that was, all of it was curiosity. One of the fascinating things for me is that there, that, that there is this sort of, this worldview of science uh, and natural science in particular about how we understand the world around us, uh, that I think there is some deep meaning behind it. The fact that this all seems to work as well as it does, uh, that it seems to answer so many of the questions that we have, that there is, there is something deep and fundamental and abiding about that, that, that we want to affirm and to lift up uh, as, as people, as, as, as a human race, um, that that is really sort of a transformational thing that has been discovered by human reason and human empirical testing uh, that we've discovered this thing about the world around us. So I think there has been a, a wide, there is a widening appreciation in chemistry that a large portion of chemistry has been funded by the consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, that was, we are, we are to blame for the technologies that are very good at burning fossil fuels and getting energy out of them. We've profited greatly from that. And now there is a certain amount of, of responsibility that comes with that. Uh, and I think that um, there are many people who are not of faith who have come to this, come to this realization. But I think as people of faith who are, uh, one of our tasks in Christianity is to be stewards of the creation that, we, that, it, that God has left for us. Uh, and part of that stewardship is recognizing when we have go gone wrong in that stewardship, when we haven't really taken care of the creation that's around us, and to, to, be, to, be, to offer that sort of mirror to people around you to say, we're, we're not really doing what we ought to be doing here. Uh, and so I think that uh, particular, particular thing is, is something where chemistry has, you know, has maybe contributed more harm than good in the past, but where we can, I think, uh, redeem ourselves uh, in, the, in the future. Part of the thing that, you, that, you have, that has to happen in order for chemists to get on board with this idea is for us to realize not only that there's a, a sort of a moral imperative here, but there is also a scientific imperative. That there really are some interesting scientific questions on the, the, this side of the side of the island. I think that, at least on the sort of academic side of things, chemists are really coming around the idea that renewable energy has a lot of really interesting questions at the level of chemistry and physics and material science. Uh, really fundamental questions that we want to answer and understand. Um, and I think that in terms of how far this stretches downstream into the sort of industrial applications of chemistry and the, the how, how it gets played out in society and pol public policy and all those things, uh, I think those are, those are a little bit harder road and a harder sell. 
um, because you also have to tie those things like economics and policy and soci sociology, um, uh, and that in intersectionality between those disciplines, I think, is 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 one that we have to that we are still working on, uh, uh, trying to trying to trying to navigate. Well, I mean, I think there's there's a bunch of ways that that faith that that the Christian faith can for me plays into that. I think that that. One is that, as a Christian, I believe that in, in exploring the world around us, we're discovering things, we're ultimately discovering things that, that God left for us to be discovered. Um, and so there's a, there's a deep sense in which exploring these things uh, helps us to learn more about the God who created the things in the first place. Uh, I think there's another thing about science that, that does have to do with how we relate to one another, how we serve one another, and how our work comes alongside to uh, to change the lives, um, often the lives of many, many people you know, who are around us. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important for me as a Christian, uh, being in a place like science, where, you know, to be honest, there, we are, we're, there are not uh, that many Christians who pursue science as a profession. Uh, and I think there is an important role for people of faith, whether they be Christian, Christian or others, uh, to be there as as uh, a voice that can say, well, sometimes science goes off the rails. Sometimes science pursues things that aren't necessarily in the right direction. Uh, and to be something that, that says, well, to be that corrective voice that says, well, there, there are reasons that we don't do this. There's reasons that we shouldn't move in this direction. Uh, and there are times where being a person of faith requires that kind of, kind of a voice. But within the context of being a Christian within science, it is one of the few experiences that I have of actually being a minority. And within that, I think when framed in that way, I, I feel that Christians are accepted, uh, very well accepted within the community of science as a, an, an interesting minority group. Uh, uh, so I haven't felt uh, animosity. Uh, however, there are certainly times where I've encountered colleagues who are, I'll say, well, you know, shouldn't you think about where you're getting funding from or the work that you're doing with this particular company that does this particular thing? Uh, and there'll just be a complete lack of comprehension that there would ever be a moral question or a moral dimension to the things that we're doing. Um, and, and then that's one of those times where, I mean, they're not rejecting me as a Christian, but I just have to recognize that, well, one of the things that Christianity gives me is the moral framework with which to try to address some of these things. Uh, and that I think many of my colleagues, though they are terrific scientists and, and wonderful thinkers and, and often very good people, uh, they many times lack that framework with which to, to think about complex ethical questions uh, that they might, might, might encounter in their research. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was actually not uh, an active Christian. I wasn't going to church or doing any of those kinds of things. Uh, and, but there was one day when I was getting ready to go into lab, and I don't know how to describe it in any other way, any other way except for to say that I felt that God spoke to me. Uh, he, he, and uh, what he said was rather unexpected. Since I was a graduate student, it's not like I was wealthy or had you know, you know, a fancy car or any of those kinds of things, but his message was that I needed to uh, give away uh, the things that I was depending on so that he could lift me up. Uh, and I probed and asked, well, you know, what are those things? And you know, is it like you know, my car or my clothes or the money in my bank account? And the answer that I got back was yes uh, to all. Uh, and I was, you know, pondering over that before I sort of had to think about, well, what, what, what exactly is going on here? I wasn't expecting to have any kind of dramatic spiritual religious experience. Um, and, uh, and so, I, but I was left with the question of you know, what, what, what do you do with that? You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're not expecting something miraculous and something miraculous happens, what do you do with that? And I had to think it over and decide what kind of person I wanted to be. And I uh, decided that, you know, I, I'd spend a lot of my life making the excuse, well, you know, all these other miraculous things, they happen to other people or they, you know, whatever. But if I had just one, I would, I, I would believe. And I'd always said that to myself. And I decided that this was a time where I, you know, was, you, know you, put, you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Uh, if I was gonna be that, if I actually was that kind of person, then this was the time. And so I, uh, I, I gave up those things I, uh, and over the course of you know, several months. Um, and, uh, and I did indeed have uh, a great sense of God coming alongside me in that process uh, and, and thereafter. Um, one of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is 
whether or not science gives us hope for the future. Um, uh, because I feel like as human beings, one of the things that we really need is hope. Uh, it's one of the elements of the, the stories that we tell uh, in terms of projecting into the future is, you know, where do we th see things going? Not just what, what do we think is going to happen, what do, what do we hope is going to happen? Um, and I find that science by itself doesn't necessarily do that, which is very interesting. It's, it's, it's always science combined with some other aspect of, of our life philosophy or the narrative that we're telling about ourselves. Um, and, I, and I find that to be very interesting because, of course, there's, when science by itself doesn't give you hope, there's, there's two different varieties of scientists then. There are scientists who become so beholden to science that then are so 100% science all the time that they actually don't have very much hope about the future. Uh, and that's always sad. Uh, and then there are other scientists who do seem to have hope about the future, but many of them don't know where that hope is coming from uh, or don't have much of a very firm ground for that hope. Um, and, and so I think that's been a, a, really, it's a really interesting thing for me. I've been meditating on and, 